Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to First Presbyterian Church to our 1030 service. It's great to have you with us today. If you'll take a copy of the newsletter that hopefully you received when you walked in, we want to highlight just a few announcements as we get things rolling this morning. First of all, if you're a guest visiting with us, or if you have any change of address or phone number or email, take a moment and fill out our informational card. Uh, this is a way for us to get to know you better and keep our records here in the office up to date. It's also a great way for you to communicate prayer requests or other needs you might have. You can jot notes on the back. You can stick it in the offering plate on your way out of the church this morning. And uh, feel free to use that tool as needed. By way of announcements today, we want to welcome you to our Sunday morning service. We're going to continue our study of the book of Philippians a little later on today. There are Philippians study guides in the back that walks you through all four chapters of this great book that the Apostle Paul wrote. Those are free for the taking. There's plenty in the back. So if you didn't get one last Sunday, feel free to pick one up today. This week is a busy week. This Saturday, August 7th, from 3 to 6.30 is our one-day community vacation Bible school. This event is a partnership between First Presbyterian Church and Trinity Christian Union Church. The event itself will take place at Trinity's church property at 1200 North Washington Street here in Greenfield. And uh, we're still collecting all of those food items that many of you signed up for. If you haven't brought those in, you can bring those in at any time. You can drop them off in the church office during regular business hours, uh, or you can uh, drop them off at the manse anytime during the week. And we'll be glad to add those to the food collection. If you have any questions or you'd like to get involved, please talk to Becky Anderson. Her number is 937 876 9868. Actually, 9862. That's what I said, right? 5.30 p.m. is a VBS meeting at Trinity Church tonight. Thank you for that update. We're also having a back to school bash coming up next week, Saturday, August 14th. Uh, this is where we give out school supplies to anybody in the community who needs them. Um, Saturday, August 14th, it's going to be a drive-through version of this event. Um, it's a great outreach. Most years, there's 400-plus uh, families that are served. So if you are able to donate a few items, they're still trying to round up some one-inch three-ring binders, some single-subject spiral notebooks, or the uh, packages of uh, notebook paper, the shrink-wrapped packages of notebook paper. You can bring any of those items into the church, and they'll use those for that event. Friend of mine, uh, his name is Micah Mudis Paul. He is planning a music festival here in Greenfield on August 22nd from 2:30 to 8 p.m. down at Felsons Park. It's called the Elevation Music Festival 2021. There are several Christian music artists that will be performing there. It's a free event. You can bring your lawn chair and enjoy a great day of Christian music. There's going to be some booths and uh, sales tents and exhibits set up down there too. So it's going to be a fun day for the whole family. Again, Sunday, August 22nd, 2.30 to 8, the Elevation Music Festival at Felsons Park. We're having a preschool board election next Sunday, August 8th, after the 10.30 service. Um, uh, it's a, uh, open to all the church members who are a part of that voting process. We're going to elect a new preschool board member to the First Presbyterian Church Preschool Board. So please mark that down and plan to attend. Later this month, we're still planning a movie with a message night, Sunday, August 29th, 6 to 8. I think we're going to feature the movie Signs this month. If you've never heard of that movie, uh, look it up on your phone or on your computer and, and watch the trailer for that movie. It's going to be a really interesting evening. Mark the dates of October 2nd and 3rd, 2021 on your calendar. These are the dates of the First Presbyterian Church Bicentennial Celebration, October 2nd and 3rd. We're going to gather together on a Saturday and a Sunday to celebrate 200 years of ministry in the Greenfield community. Um, we've been in contact with many of the former pastors and leaders, many of whom will be traveling in to be with us for that event. We're excited about that. Uh, so mark it down. We're going to have more information to share with you very soon about those details. Last today, I want to say a special thank you to those who donated and who helped at the rummage sale this past week. Uh, we produced $1,121.46. And over the series of the warm weather months this year, we've produced over $5,000 uh, which all has gone into either the Kids for Christ account. This last uh, effort is applying towards the future mission trip to Costa Rica. So we're excited about that. Thank you so much for all your help. So this morning we're going to prepare our hearts for worship with our morning prelude on the pipe organ, a great song called We Are Standing on Holy Ground as the ministry of our acolytes lights the altar candles and reminds us of the presence of Christ in our midst. So let's prepare our hearts for, to worship the Lord.
If you'll please join me in our responsive call to worship. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. The Lord is exalted over all the peoples of the earth. The Lord, our God, is holy. Let us worship him and praise his glorious name. Great is the Lord, holy is he. Exalted the Lord, our God. Worship at his footstools. The Lord, our God, is holy. Let us worship him and praise his glorious name. Well, let's praise God together this morning as we stand and sing our first song, Victory in Jesus. You can find that on page 353 or on the screen to the front.
Lord, the Bible tells us that we're called to pray for and pray with one another. We've come to the time in our worship service where we want to do that very thing. I'll point out to you that in your newsletter we have a prayer list of folks that we're inviting you to be praying for uh, throughout your daily devotional time. Continue to pray for Ruth Ann Washburn. Uh, she has, an, I believe, an upcoming surgery very soon, some health issues. Pray for Sandy Gerald, who's recovering from a knee replacement surgery uh, at home. And just a whole no number of others on our list that we want to lift up uh, together in prayer today. If you're watching online on our live stream, you can message in your prayer requests right on the live feed right now as you watch. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary, you can uh, step up to the microphone in the center aisle if you'd like to share a joy or a concern with us today uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer. What are your joys and concerns today? To mention uh, Ray's grandmother, Grace, she had a heart attack on Thursday. Um, she's currently at Chillicothe, um, but they put a stent in, and that, that was successful. So she is feeling a bit better, but just there's a large percentage of her heart not working. So she's just tired, um, but we're very anxious to get her home today. So if we just keep Grace in your prayers. So lift up grace, do me in our prayers. Absolutely. Other joys or concerns? Uh, I just uh, want to uh, let everybody know that uh, Heather is in the hospital also. Uh, she's having some uh, personal issues, and um, hopefully she'll be home soon. Uh, just, just keep praying for her that you know, she get some uh, peace in her insider. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Let's remember Heather Cumbo in our prayers. Other joys or concerns? Remember Brian Stapleton's family. Yes. And we have a praise. Devin's daddy is coming home this week from Jordan. Wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. Any other joys or concerns you'd like to share with your church family today? I'd like to ask for prayer for Mike and Paula Fresh Hour. Um, he has some health concerns, but I think they're keeping it kind of private right now. That's true. Let's remember Mike and Paula Fresh Hour in our prayers. Any others this morning? And even those things that we don't share into a microphone in a public worship service, God knows those things too. And we can bring every burden, every struggle, every problem every issue that we face to the Lord. So would you join me and bow your heads this morning as we do that very thing. Let's pray. Lord, you've heard our requests. You've heard our concerns and you've heard our joys. Lord, we give you praise for all things. We praise you, Lord, even when we're going through difficult times. Through your spirit, Lord, help us to keep our focus on Jesus in those difficult times that we might be reminded that your presence is with us always. Your spirit it lives in our hearts and that we can trust you regardless of the circumstances of life around us. I pray for these names and these families that have been mentioned this morning. I pray for the requests that are coming in online this morning, that you would be with each situation, each person, each family, and above all, would Jesus be glorified in that situation. Draw people closer to yourselves. For those who haven't yet discovered the grace of Christ and put their trust in him, Lord, may your word continue to be preached. May your spirit be at work and draw many to yourself. We thank you for your goodness unto us. Be with us today as we gather, as we worship you, as we sing praises, as we study your word, and as we fellowship with our family of faith. May this time be profitable for all, and may it be glorifying to our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we do pray, the very one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Every month at our church, we have the opportunity and the privilege to be reminded of the sacrifice of our Savior Jesus Christ by celebrating what we call Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. And this morning, we want to do that very thing. I know over the past year and a half, uh, 
during the pandemic, we have served communion in those little prepackaged units that you all have, you've, you've been really cheerful about it, but we've had to choke those down sometimes. They're not the greatest things that we ever partook of, are they? Well, today we're serving traditional communion again, and I'm happy to be able to say that to you. But we're going to do it in a bit of the style of what we call intinction, which means when we get to the moment in the service where we begin to celebrate this, uh, we're going to invite you to just make your way down the center aisle in a single file line or with your spouse, if you wish. You're going to step up to the communion table, and I'm going to serve you right here, offering you the bread to remind us of the body of Jesus. You can partake right here in front of the a communion table, offering you the cup, the juice that reminds us of the shed blood of our Savior. And we're going to do things that way this morning to mix it up just a little bit. But let's be reminded this morning, when I was a small child and they served communion in my home church when I was a little itty bitty kid, I used to think, well, it's like it's snack time. But we all know that this is way more than just snack time in a worship service. This is more than just some religious pomp and circumstance that we throw into a service to fill up five minutes. This is a holy and sacred moment where we remember the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and be reminded that he offers us his free gift of salvation through his grace. The Bible teaches us that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup in the same manner, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sins. Paul later in the New Testament writes, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so this morning, that's what we do. In this quiet and sacred and somber moment, and yet a moment of celebration, we remember the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We remember his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. And as we partake today, let us remember what Christ Jesus did for us and how he offers us freely this gift of salvation through his grace. Let's take just a moment of silent prayer and then we will begin. Loving and living God, in these moments help us, your people, your church, to remember your perfect sacrifice on the cross of Calvary for us. May we remember your broken body and your shed blood on our behalf. And for this, Lord, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. As God directs you, I invite you to the table.
given for us. And the blood of Christ shed for the remission of our sins. Lord, we offer you our praise freely today. It's not hard for us to see your goodness. Thank you for this reminder of how Christ Jesus was nailed to the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, but rose again on the third day to purchase our pardon and to secure our salvation. May our trust be in him and him alone today. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said, amen. What a blessing to celebrate the Lord's Supper together today, amen. As we continue on in our time of worship today, would you stand if you're able and join the worship team once again as they lead us in a beautiful song called In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
Today's scripture reading is coming from Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 30. For I know that through your prayers and God's provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now and always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is, to, is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way, by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For that has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I, have, uh, that I still have. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. I'm excited about our study in the book of Philippians, and I want to take you back to chapter 1 with me for a little bit this morning. If you have your Bible, keep your Bible open to Philippians chapter 1, because we want to uh, hone in on what Paul was teaching the believers at the church of Philippi in this great passage of Scripture. Let's review for about 30 seconds, shall we? Last Sunday we started this series, and we talked about how Paul said we can experience joy even when things go wrong. Did anybody need that lesson this week? Yeah, did anybody do like me and you maybe didn't score real high on that test? That probably means we have to try it again this coming week, don't we? Experiencing joy even when things go wrong. Did you know that we learned that Paul had joy despite disappointment? We, were, we mentioned that he was in prison and he was separated from his friends at Philippi. He couldn't go be with them. And he was greatly disappointed by this fact, but he teaches clearly that he was able to experience joy even when he didn't get what he wanted. What a great lesson for American Christians to hear. He experienced joy even when he didn't get what he wanted. We also learned last Sunday that Paul had joy despite suffering, verses 12 through 14. Uh, we, we understand that Paul's suffering was rooted in things like persecution, arrest, imprisonment, and so much more that Paul went through during the time of his ministry. Uh, and none of that occurred because he had broken some kind of law or he had, had done something wrong, but it all occurred because he was a Christian and was following Jesus. And so instead of complaining about this persecution and this imprisonment, Paul said God was using it for the benefit of the kingdom of God, and he was grateful and joyous because of it. Third and lastly, we, last Sunday we learned that Paul had joy despite conflict. There were those that we read last week that were trying to cause trouble and stir up trouble for the Apostle Paul out of envy and rivalry. They were preaching Christ, of course, but they were doing it out of the wrong motives. Paul says in that first half of chapter 1 that he could care less about what people said about him just so long as Christ was being preached. It was kind of like Paul did this. And, and it, really, it was really a source of joy and freedom in his life. Well, we're going to jump back into this study today. Last week we asked ourselves, do we lose our joy when we face disappointment, suffering, or conflict? And how can we maintain that joyful attitude even when things go wrong? This Sunday we're going to discuss for just a few moments experiencing joy in life and in death, verses 19 through 30 in Philippians 1. When you learn about the Apostle Paul, do you, do you quickly notice that Paul was all in? That means that his life had been transformed to such a degree that he was all in. His entire self was completely sold out to God. Do you remember his background? He didn't start out as a missionary. He started out as a murderer. Do you remember? He was holding the coats of people who were throwing stones to kill the very first martyr in Acts chapter 8. 
Stephen. And Paul was wanting to destroy this, this group called Christianity. But then God knocked him off his high horse, literally, and struck him blind and turned his life around. Paul put his faith in Christ Jesus, and everything was different ever since. As a result, he was all in. He believed that living for God meant that we give God our body, our mind, and our will. It's the whole person that now belongs to Jesus when Jesus truly transforms our life. John Kreitz is one of our adult Sunday school teachers. This, this, this is his favorite verse, I think, in the Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, that good, acceptable, pleasing, and perfect will. So Paul says, give God your mind, your body, and your will. It's the whole person that now belongs to Jesus. He wants to transform everything, physically, intellectually, volitionally, our actions, our thoughts, our choices, all of it is being transformed by Jesus. Let me ask you and, and me this morning, how are we doing there? Are you seeing transformation in your life? In your body, your mind, and your will. Paul would say it needs to be occurring or something is greatly wrong. So Paul is writing to the Philippian Christians about this idea of giving God your body, put, like your whole life is in his hands. He emphasizes the importance of honoring God with his body. Some of you used to go to a Sunday school class or to junior church or maybe to vacation Bible school and you heard a, a little children's song. Have you ever heard the song that says, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Or, be careful, little ears, what you hear, little mouth, what you say, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. You know how it goes? For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Some of you have heard that one. I think we should have Sean Hickok come up and sing that for us this morning, right? He said, no, here he comes. Uh, this, this is a great children's song, and it's teaching the same theology that Paul is teaching in the second half of Philippians chapter 1. That we need to give God our whole self. And Paul says, I want God to have all of me, whether I live or whether I die. Whether my body is living, whether my body has died and has been put in the grave. Paul says, I want to be used by God for the glory of God in either case. See, he wanted to honor God with his body, whether he lived or he died. Let's look at this for a moment. Two parts of that. There's the in-life part, and there's the in-death part. Let's look at in-life first. If you have your Bible open to chapter 1 still, you'll notice that Paul says he wanted to honor God with his body by doing what, what is referred to there in the text as fruitful labor. He wants to honor God in life with fruitful labor. Verse 22 Paul says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. What is he saying? Well, for Paul, in his particular case, his fruitful labor looked like things like writing and preaching and witnessing and encouraging others and living for Christ and influencing this newborn church that was continually developing and spreading across the known world of the day. If he was going to live, that stuff was going to keep going and spreading and growing and being stronger. See, and he believed that if he lived, it would be to the benefit of the believers in Philippi and elsewhere. He mentions that to them in the text, verse 24 and 25. He says, but if I remain in the flesh, it's more necessary on your account. So convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith. So Paul is thinking about the good of others as he's talking about living his life continually in the flesh. Remember, his body is locked up in a Roman prison as he writes this letter. His body didn't have a lot of physical freedom. He was shackled to a Roman prison guard. But he says, if I have to continue living in the body like this, at least it's for your good and for your growth. Wow. Fruitful labor. See, as long as Paul lived, he planned to make his life count. I know some of you this morning, you feel that way. You want to live a life of significance. Not, not of significance that points to you and your goodness and your efforts and, and it puffs you up somehow. No, but the goodness of living for God. Charles Studd has been accredited with this quote that I have on the screen this morning. C.T. Studd said, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's what Paul was living in his life. He wants to live and honor God in life and also in death. 
He didn't just expect there to be this fruitful living, but he also expected some gainful dying. He, he really did. Verse 21, you can read it for yourself. This is, this is a verse, by the way, that you ought to memorize in Philippians chapter 1. Lots of wonderful memory verses here, but here's one that really the, the entire text today really hinges upon. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 21. And that's how Paul lived his life. He says in verse 22 and 23, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor, yet which I choose, I, sh I really can't tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. You see, it was far better for Paul than, than these things on the list of what he's faced already in his physical life, things like persecution, scourging, stoning, arrest, imprisonment, and yes, one of these days he would be executed for his faith. He says, compared to all that stuff, well, sure, to be with Christ sure does sound far better. In other words, what Paul was teaching was that he was not afraid to die. Whether he lived or whether he died, he said, it's all about Jesus. He was not afraid to die because if he died, he was confident that he would be with Christ. I've been at the bedside of many a person over the years and their dying moments. Some of them seemed terrified. Others had this uncanny peace about them that it was as if the angels of heaven themselves had come into the room with us. Why the difference? Well, from my vantage point, looking into the family situation, it seemed that those who knew that they belonged to Jesus, they knew that they knew that they knew that their sins had been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, knew that if they died, they would be in his very presence. Did you know that the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints? Do you know that's in there? Paul, Paul speaks to this issue in lots of places. He wrote another letter in the New Testament to another church, the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians 5.8, he says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So here's Paul writing to the Philippians, rehearsing this same good Bible theology, saying, well, whether I live, it's all about Jesus, and whether I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. And so Paul was really saying, I'm a winner either way. You know, as I was studying this week, I, I immediately thought of a song that I've heard, um, sung by a, a friend of mine who's a part, uh, been a part of the Good Shepherd Church where I used to serve as their minister. And so the other morning as I was uh, studying about this and thinking about it a lot, I texted Thelma and I said, hey, I've been studying and God has reminded me of this song that you sing. I just wanted to let you know that it was on my mind today and it's been kind of a cool time uh, studying and thinking about it. And would you, would you believe that Thelma is with us this morning? This is Thelma Sterling Sharon. She sings this great country gospel song called I'm a Winner Either Way. And we decided in our little conversation that day, well, what if Thelma just came and sang it? Now, rather than me just tell you about it, wouldn't it just be better if she just sang it to us? So would you welcome Thelma as she comes and sings I'm a Winner Either Way?
It's way better when she sings it than if I just told you about it. Thank you, Thelma. Make sure you greet Thelma on, on your way out today. She came here just for the very purpose of singing that song uh, as a result of uh, what I was studying this week. And I really, really appreciate that, Thelma. Thank you for being here. Paul knew that whether he lived or whether he died, he was a winner either way. And I hope that you know the same thing for your life. But Paul doesn't just talk about himself in chapter 1. He goes on to say to the Philippian Christians, he says, not only does he, the apostle, want to uh, offer God his body in life or death, but he wanted them to do the same thing. And in the second part of this text, he gives them very specific ways in which they can do that. Verses 27 through 30, Paul says, and Philippian Christians, here's how you can give God your body and live for God, whether in life or death, yourself. And he ends it with a very practical list for these Christians. In, in the slides that you see on the screen, uh, the, the top scripture quote that I've put there is uh, taken from the English Standard Version, the ESV. It's one of the ones I've been studying in lately, one of my new favorites. Um, it's real, real close to the original languages, as a matter of fact. The bottom in the white text, that's the MAV. That's the Mike Anderson version. This is me telling you a little bit of what, what I think the top one's talking about, okay? So verse 27, Paul says to the Philippians, you, you want to give God your body and life and death? So here you go. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, he's saying you need to live a life that shows that you have been transformed by Christ or live a lifestyle that points to Jesus. You want to give God your body and life and death? Here's a great place to start. He goes on to say in verse 27, and standing firm, standing firm. That means to be grounded in the truth, not being swayed by false teaching or unbiblical practices. He says, Philippian Christians, stand firm. Are we standing firm today? He goes on in that same verse, verse 27. He says that for them to be of one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. What I believe he's trying to teach us here is that we need to work together in unity with fellow believers to build the church and reach the world. In other words, I can't do that by myself. You can't do that by yourself. All of us working together need to be the ones that get that job done. That's an awful big job. What is there, 8 billion some people in the world today? A lot of those people have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Guess whose responsibility it is to tell them? You and me. So we need to be in one spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, Paul says to the Christians in Philippi, don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. Boy, I think this one is very relevant right now for today. I think Paul is teaching them that they need to be confident enough in their faith that they're not intimidated by people, philosophies, or movements that are opposed to biblical Christianity. Might relate back to that standing firm thing a little bit. 
not frightened by our opponents. We are surrounded in our world with an anti-Christian and non-Christian culture who would say to you and me, it's okay for you to have your faith, but shut your mouth in public and keep it in the four walls of your house, and I don't want to hear anything about it outside of there. You keep it in your church, we don't want to hear about it anywhere else. Paul says to these folks, don't be frightened by your opponents. Now, I'm not a person who... uh, who teaches that Christianity is somehow belligerent. I don't think that's an effective strategy for the spreading of the kingdom of God. But here's what I do know, that we shouldn't be intimidated by those other philosophies and schools of thought that may be out there in the world today. In other words, we need to be sold out enough to the gospel of Jesus that we're confident enough in what the Bible teaches that that stuff doesn't scare us. He says, don't be frightened by your opponents. He says, and be willing to suffer for Christ's sake, verse 29. Because when you take a stand for biblical truth in an anti-Christian and non-Christian culture, people will notice. And they might not like what you've said or what they've heard. He says, so in other words, you need to be willing to face hardship, adversity, persecution, or mistreatment because of your deep love and commitment to Jesus. I wonder... Most of us in the room are probably okay with being a Christian as long as it's easy, as long as nothing goes wrong. But I wonder, are we as committed to being a Christian and following Jesus when stuff goes bad, when people aren't treating us right, when we're being persecuted, mistreated, or rejected because of our faith? He says, be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. Take it as it comes and keep your stand. And last, verse 30, be engaged in the same conflict as Paul, he says to these people. What conflict was he in? Do you remember Look back to that list. He had been scourged and beaten and stoned and thrown in jail, and he was, they're threatening to kill him and all. He says, be engaged in the same conflict. He's saying to the Philippian Christians, if you stand for Jesus courageously, it's likely that they may do some of the same stuff to you folks. So follow the courageous example of the Apostle Paul by living for Jesus no matter the cost. So let me ask you this morning, friend, Do these qualities of living for God describe you and me? You know, I don't know about you, but when I preach, I'm often preaching to myself. You folks just get to listen in. When I I study through a passage, the passage beats me up and shakes me up. I'm hearing it like you're hearing it, and the Holy Spirit's working in me like hopefully he's working in you. And I read a list like that, and and God's Holy Spirit says to me, Mike, you've got a long way to go. And there's areas you need to be buckling down on. And that's right. Maybe it's right for you too. Do you desire to make your life count for the glory of God? Remember the quote by Stud, this one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Is that what you want for your life? Are there specific ways that you are investing your life in the service of God? I believe every member of the church is to be a minister for Jesus. I don't mean a minister that had to go to a seminary or stands up in front in the pulpit and preaches every Sunday. That might not be the kind of minister you are, although maybe some of you might be that kind of minister. But every one of us has a job, a responsibility, and a calling by God upon our life, a, a part of the body of Christ that we are performing a task for the honor of Jesus and the benefit of his kingdom. What's yours? What's yours? Are you doing it or have you been ignoring it? Don't ignore it anymore. We need you. The body of Christ needs you. Because God is calling all of us. He's gifted all of us. He's placed all of us in opportunities to make a difference for his kingdom by investing our life in service to God. What's yours? And are you willing to follow Jesus even if you face hardship, persecution, or mistreatment? I'm not talking about being a fair-weather Christian, following Jesus when the sky is sunny and the roses are blooming only but following Jesus even when things get tough. Are we willing, like Paul, to do that? Do you believe that whether you live or whether you die, you're a winner either way? I hope you have that kind of confidence in your relationship with God and in his word, that whether you live, it's Christ. Whether you die, you're going to be with Christ, so you're a winner either way. Whichever way it happens to go for you, it's all about Jesus in either case. I would pray that people would say that about me and you. One of these days. Paul says we can experience joy in life and in death. And I pray that that is a reality in your heart this morning. Would you bow your heads for a moment?
Maybe you're kind of like me that when you wrestle through a scripture text like this, the Holy Spirit begins to kind of poke and prod at you and, and illuminate some parts of your life where maybe he wants to do some work. That's been happening to me. Maybe it's been happening to you. In the quietness of this moment, would you just whisper a prayer to the Lord? Said, Lord, do your work in me. Mold me and shape me. I'm yours. I'm all in. Just like the Apostle Paul, I want to be all in. Body, mind, will, everything about me. Lord, make me yours. Give me strength to follow you each day. Amen. Let's stand once more together as we sing a song of response. You can find it on page 762. The screen's to the front. What a day that will be. Thank you all for being with us for worship this morning. I want to thank Thelma for sharing her beautiful song with us today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this is a busy week at First Presbyterian Church. This Saturday is our community VBS, the partnership between our church and the Trinity Christian Union Church. This Saturday, see Becky if you have further questions or need any insight on that. Uh, pray for me this week. I'm doing a lot of outside speaking engagements. I'm preaching tomorrow night over, or tomorrow afternoon over at Tar Hollow for camp. I'm looking forward to that. It'll be my first time speaking at camp. Look forward to seeing those folks. I'll be preaching later at the end of the week, two times at the Christian Union State Council. So um, I'm going to be here and there. So pray for me this week. I appreciate you being here today. And uh, let's ask the Lord to help us all to live for him no matter what, in life or in death. Either way, we are Christ's. Let us pray.
Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for our time together where we could worship you and study your word. Now take your word through your Holy Spirit. May it find lodging in all of our hearts that we might live our lives in a way that glories, brings glory and honor to Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Have a great day.